As we continue our treatment of thermodynamics, I would like to pause for a moment to think about a microscopic picture of heat transfer. So what you're seeing here is a very bad representation of a salt crystal here and another salt crystal here. This one will be at a higher temperature to start. And this one will be at a lower temperature to start. And what I've done with these two, and the, bond, the, the uh, bonds are represented by the black lines here, and the red wigglies represent the um, kinetic and potential energy of the uh, atoms. So where we have a high temperature, this corresponds to high thermal energy. Where we have a low temperature, this corresponds to low thermal energy. Now what I'm going to do here is I'll put them into thermal contact and I'll do this by just having them directly touch each other. So that means that specifically I want to look at the um, this column of atoms here in our salt crystal and this column of atoms here in our salt crystal. So the adjacent atoms here, since they're in direct contact, are just as likely to interact with each other as they are with the atoms in the salt crystal. Now this means that we'll have elastic collisions between, say, this atom here on the left and this atom here on the right. Now what's going to happen is because it's an elastic collision, we've already seen that when you have an elastic collision, the... Um, the one that has more kinetic energy tends to lose it to the one that has less. So I'll take away some wigglies here to represent a loss of thermal energy on those atoms, and I'll give those wigglies to these atoms here. But that same process will now continue adjacently. So what this will mean is that this slab of atoms here will interact with these, give some of its energy to these. This one will interact with these, give some of its energy to these, and so forth. So what we've done is we've set up a direction in which we are causing thermal energy to be transferred, and we call this a heat flow. and we usually denote heat with the symbol Q. So we'll say that we have a, um, a flow of heat, a transfer of heat from the hot object to the cold. And the way to think about heat is just to think of it as energy, thermal energy in transit. It is careful to acknowledge that there is no such thing as heat. It's just that we're having a exchange of energy between these objects because of their temperature difference. And what's happening here is an atom by atom interchange. Now, the ultimate uh, endpoint of this process, and I won't draw the whole thing, um, but the, the ultimate endpoint much later is that our salt crystal that was at a higher temperature will now be cooler. And our salt crystal that was cooler will now be warmer. And if we wait long enough, eventually what will happen is that by enough successive collisions, all of the atoms in the high temperature salt crystal will now have a lower kinetic and potential energy, meaning that this salt crystal's thermal energy has gone down. And the, all the atoms here will have gained energy, so we'll say that the thermal energy of the what was the cooler salt crystal will have gone up. And 
Now the end point of this process is that there won't be any overall heat flow. It'll still be possible that you have random exchanges of energy back and forth between each of the atoms, but it's something that all comes out in the wash. So we'll say here the heat flow is, the, the heat being transferred is zero, so we have no heat flow. So now this gets us to the zeroth law of thermodynamics. This means that um, the two objects are in thermal, con not only in thermal contact, but they are in thermal equilibrium. Since they're in thermal equilibrium, this means that they have the same temperature. So I'll say T final, T final. This one would have seen a decrease in temperature to get to that point. This one would have seen an increase in temperature to get to that point. So what we see is that the heat will flow spontaneously um, from the hot object to the cold object until the uh, temperatures equalize out. And note this is a spontaneous heat flow. This actually turns out to be a statement of the second law of thermodynamics, but we'll get to that eventually. Now, early on, when thermodynamics researchers were <coughs> working on um, developing the laws of thermodynamics, it was they're studying heat transfers. If you keep track of all the bookkeeping of heat transfers, it, they noticed that the math of it was all the same as the math for fluids. And so they were actually wondering if there was some sort of fluid being transferred. Eventually, there were some experiments done that involved boring cannons in different clever ways and stuff like that. So that they eventually convinced themselves that there wasn't any fluid actually being transferred or anything. So they wondered what the heck was going on, and the idea that it was an energy transfer came about. So the, fine, so the test of this was due to an experiment by Joule, as in... The person who became the unit. So now what Joule did was say here if we have um, a beaker of water, a well insulated beaker of water, and we can imagine sticking a thermometer in here, um, we know that one way we can get the temperature to go up is if we turn on a Bunsen burner underneath it or something like that, have a flame, we'll see that the temperature goes up. If, as people were suspecting, this was a heat trend, that, that this is actually a transfer of mechanical energy, of mechanical energy, what Joule reasoned you could do instead was you could put in, so instead of having a Bunsen burner, um, he stuck in a little paddle wheel kind of arrangement. And my drawing is going to look terrible. I'm terribly sorry. All right, something like that. So he had this paddle wheel arrangement that was hooked up to some pulleys. And then you had a weight here, and you let the weight fall. And we could figure, if you rigged this up in such a way that it fell at a constant speed, then you knew that the gravitational potential energy um, was ultimately all transferred, was ultimately all had work done against it by the viscous drag of the fluid. And so, contrawise, this means the paddles were doing the change in gravitational potential energy worth of work on the fluid. And if the what everyone was suspecting was right, that this was a, um, a transfer of energy, then the uh, temperature should go up. And indeed, that was exactly what happened. And so for historic reasons, because some people weren't 100% willing to be convinced that Joule's experiment was definitive, and so it took a while for everyone to eventually sign on, this usually gets called the mechanical equivalent of heat. Eventually, 
there's really no equivalence here. We just recognize that it is a transfer of thermal energy. In here, the thermal energy is coming from work done by a dissipative force versus here where it's gas molecules colliding, hot gas molecules colliding against the bottom of the beaker. But that took a while for everyone to sign on to. Anyway, when people had been doing work on, um, or had been studying heat transfers, the, one of the units of heat transfer that was being used, which we eventually said was energy, was the calorie. And this was defined as the heat required to raise one gram of water, one Celsius degree. And actually there are very specific temperatures that we do this at to account for the fact that the density of water changes a bit with temperature, but we don't need to worry about that so much. What Joule showed was that you could get one gram of water to go up one Celsius degree if in, instead of um, using a Bunsen burner you did 4.184 Joules of work. Now obviously the unit Joule hadn't been invented yet, but that was the idea. So this does lead to some confusion with units that we do need to be a bit careful about. So a lot in, in a lot of thermodynamics texts they'll work in calories because it's very convenient. But you also have to be careful that this calorie isn't the same thing as a food calorie or what you'll find on the nutrition facts label. So a food calorie, also known as a great calorie, um, you can tell apart because you use a capital C instead of a small c. I'm not making that up. That's why it's calories capital C on a nutrition facts label. And that is 1,000 of these thermodynamic calories. Or we can say that one food calorie is one kilocalorie. And a lot of countries prefer to write KCAL instead of capital C-A-L for the food calories. So just be a little bit careful there. Um, so sadly, if you were thinking that if you ate a Snickers bar, you could make it all go away by just taking a cold bath, that fact that you're going to times this all by a thousand means that isn't going to happen. All right. So now with that out of the way, I want to transition to talking about work done on a gas. And it is important here that we are talking about work being done on the gas. Um, a lot of texts, and in fact, even a little later in this treatment, um, will you know, sometimes be talking about the work that's being done by a gas. And so there will be differences in plus and minus signs between different um, ther books on thermodynamics. And honestly, it's about a 50-50 split because they both have their advantages. Physicists tend to be interested in work done on a gas because the gas is the system. And generally, we consider any energy transfers into a system to be positive and out of a system to be negative. So that's why we'll be talking about work being done on a gas. On the other hand, engineers tend to be very interested in the negative of that, which is work done buy a gas because they're interested in the useful work that can come out of an engine or something like that. And it's not like everybody rigorously sits with one definition or the other. Um, you do tend to go back and forth um, depending what's the most useful. But I would say in physics the default treatment is work done on a gas. But even there, there, there's a lot of variation between books. And as we get to stating the first law, I'll show you how you can tell which convention a book is adopting. But to this end, let's think about a pro, just some random thermodynamic process. So what I've got here is a piston. 
and somehow, maybe via heat transfer or some, some other way, um, somehow we are going to have our uh, piston expand out. And we'll just have it expand out a differential distance um, dx to our new location here. So the since we're interested in the work being done, and we'll go ahead and assume that this is being done very slowly and at a constant speed, so we don't have to worry about the kinetic energy of the piston. Um, that will stay a constant. So since so in this situation here, where we're thinking about this happening at a constant speed, this would be a case of dynamic equilibrium. So we would have a force by the, on, of the, by the gas, due to the pressure on the gas, pushing on the piston this way, and then we'll have some sort of external force, may just be from the pressure of the surrounding air, or we could have a, a piston rod or something like this connected to it to attach to a load, something like that. So, Anyway, the if we go and take a look at the work that's being done on this on the gas, that would be this the work being done by this external force right here. So the work being done on the gas will be equal to the uh, so I should say the differential of work being done on the gas will be equal to that external force dotted with my differential displacement dx. Now the angle between these two is 180 degrees so the dot product is just going to serve to give us a minus sign. So this will be equal to minus the external force times dx. Um, now because in magnitude this is the, the external force is the same as the as the force from the gas because we're assuming dynamic equilibrium I'll just go ahead and substitute that and the force due to the gas we saw before is P times A and that'll be dx so this will be minus P now a dx here is going to be the differential this differential of volume right here, dv, a being the cross-sectional area of my piston, and dx being this extra distance here. This cross-sectional area times this distance will give me that differential of volume. So it'll be p dv. And if we want, we can integrate the, a lot of times people just leave it like this, but if we want, we can integrate it to get that the work done on the gas will be minus the integral from the initial to the final volume, P dV. And if it was a book that was interested in the work being done by the gas, um, then we would just had a F gas right here and the dot product would have been positive. So this if it's work being done by the gas, we would just drop this minus sign. But for now, for this treatment, we're talking about the work being done on the gas. So this gives us a graphical interpretation of our work. Um, if I go ahead and draw a PV diagram for some process. Um, so say this is my initial state and this is my final state and my PV diagram looks something like that. Um, the area under this curve would be, would be this integral right here to within the minus sign. So what we can say is that the work being done on the gas is going to be equal to that area under the curve and then we'll have to throw in some provisos here. We'll say if the process is going from left to right, 
v initial be less than v final, my integral will be positive, I pick up a minus sign. So then the we would say that the work is negative if we're going from left to right. On the other hand, if this arrow were the other way, so instead of an expansion volume increasing, we had a compression volume decreasing, then the our v initial would be sm um, smaller than our v, sorry, our v initial would be bigger than our v final, making this integral negative, and then the minus sign would make that positive. So it would be positive if the process is going from right to left. Now, as we are working over the next few videos towards talking about um, heat engines, we'll be concerned, we'll also be thinking about what if we have some process running in a cycle. So if we have some pro or process running in a cycle, maybe it'll look something like this. This is actually a particularly special cycle, which we'll see later. Um, if we follow this through, the work, this bit and this bit are both part of the power stroke because the volume is increasing. And this bit and this bit are both part of the compression stroke because the volume is decreasing. So the total work done um, on the gas will be the work done on the gas during the power stroke minus the work done on the gas in the compression stroke. So what this will mean is that over one cycle, the work will just be equal to the area bounded by the cycle. Um, again, in here, um, if the process is going clockwise, um, this left to right contribution will be a bigger negative, these left to right contributions will be bigger negative numbers than these right to left contributions are positive. So I'll net out that's negative if the cycle runs clockwise in PV space and positive if it runs counterclockwise in PV space. All right, now with one last bit here, I do, before I can introduce the first law and talk about it a bit, um, I need to just mention briefly something called the quasi-static process assumption, which is a mouthful. So there it is. So what the quasi-static process assumption is, is basically just means it runs really slow, slowly. So for instance, I can think of some sort of expansion process like this. So this is say some really well insulated piston sleeve and then here's my actual piston, here's the gas. And then what I'm going to imagine is just having a whole stack of coins. Like so. Huge stack of very thin coins. And then what you do is you remove one of the coins. Now, by removing one of the coins, I've decreased the, um, the external force. So the gas is going to expand and the piston will move up just a little bit. Um, now, what, because it's a very thin coin, it doesn't move very much. And, um, the, and so we wait a very long time for any differences in temperature in the gas to subside. This gets back to this issue when we were thinking about the heat transfer in the salt crystal. When I first put the two salt crystals right next to each other, 
um, this bit back here is still hotter than the bits in the middle, and these bits here are cooler than the bits in the middle, but if we wait long enough, it all settles out. So we've got a similar issue here. When I take this coin off the stack, just very briefly, the thermal energy of this bit of the gas will be slight, the, the average thermal energy per molecule of this bit of the gas will be very slightly different than this bit of the gas down here. And so by taking off one very thin coin, we're hoping that that difference is extremely minimal. And then we wait a long time for it all to st steady back out so that we have a well-defined temperature throughout the gas. Once we've done that, we remove another coin. We wait a very long time for things to settle down, remove another coin, etc. And the whole point of this sort of a process, and the, this is more of a thought experiment than anything, is that what it means is we can actually, under the quasi-static process assumption, we can actually draw a PV diagram. And the reason for this is that for real-world processes, a real-world PV diagram is surprisingly lame. For most real-world PV diagrams, all you can do is just draw the initial and the final point. And this is because, say, if you're burning fuel in a piston in an internal combustion engine or something like that, the temperature is not well-defined throughout all the gas in the cylinder. It varies wildly depending on location. And so the, the, there's no consistent thermal energy, average thermal energy. We can't talk about defining a consistent uh, pressure. Because we can't talk about defining a consistent pressure, we literally, all we can do is just draw the initial and the final states once things have settled down. And pretty much just leave a big question mark for how they ever got connected. Under the quasi-static ass process assumption, we can actually draw the, the line connecting the two. And the whole idea is, is that the changes happening were so slow that we had a well-defined pressure and volume at all times. And this is important because the actual work that you get out depends on the path. For instance, the work done by this purple path will be greater than the work done along this black path that I drew here, just because we have a bigger area under the curve between our initial and final states. So, I'm sorry, I should say the absolute value because, of course, all these works are negative. So, the um, in, in this example, but the magnitude of the work being done on the gas is greater for the purple path than for the um, black path. So the moral of the story here is that the work um, depends on the path in our, along our PV diagram. And so if we can't draw the diagram, then we can't compute the work. Now, it may sound like a bunch of hooey to think about this going forward, but it turns out that for a lot of results, um, <clears throat> for a lot of key results in thermodynamics, all that matters is that you can draw a path, whether or not that is the actual path that happened. There are a lot of results that you can get just by drawing a path anyway. And engineers um, who think about heat transfer all the time um, have all these clever ways of drawing quasi-static quasi processes that give the correct result for the real-world process that happened. So real-world, you can't draw it, but there's a whole engineering art to being able to draw um, processes that follow the quasi-static process assumption that give you the right answers for that kind of engine anyway. 
So it isn't as bad as it sounds. All right, so with all of that, we are now ready to state the first law of thermodynamics. So this, if you're keeping score, this is actually the second of the laws that we have stated because there was a zero at the law. And this is just pure and simple energy conservation. It says that the change in the thermal energy of a system is equal to the work done on the gas plus the heat transferred into the gas. So we'll go ahead and uh, just keep track of our plus and minus signs here because this is going this is unfortunately one of the annoyances of the first law. So if delta E thermal is positive this means that the thermal energy increased and if it's negative, it means that the thermal energy decreased. And this will usually, unless there's a like a phase change happening or something like that, this will usually correspond to the temperature going up or the temperature going down. But I can't quite say that because of the possibility that material could that the matter involved could be changing phase. So again here if the if Q is positive, that means that the system gains heat. And if Q is negative, that means that the system loses heat. And then here's where you have the great divide in books. Um, we'll be adopting the definition that if the work W is positive, this means that work is being done on the system. And if it's negative, we'll say that the work is, that means that the work is being done by the system. Now, important here is that this is not universally agreed on. It's about a 50-50 split, whether it's defined this way or the exact opposite way. The fastest way you can tell with any book is to flip to its treatment of the first law of thermodynamics or the first time they state it. If you see it written as W plus Q or Q plus W, it's following our convention. A lot of books will write Q minus W. If that's the case, it'll be following the convention where positive work is work done by the system and negative work is work done on the system. And like I said, this is about a 50-50 split. Um, different, basically the thermodynamics community has simply agreed to disagree on this issue and we just have to deal with it. Now, one of the things that we get out of that we'll get out of this is an alternate statement of the first law. And I will justify it in one direction, but not the other. So it turns out that in the early history of developing the laws of thermodynamics, there were actually lots of statements about what thermodynamic systems could and could not do. And there's about a good 15 year period or so of workers realizing that they had actually written a whole bunch of equivalent statements that sounded radically different. And you, I'll just have to say you can, you'll have to take it on faith, but with any of these statements of the first law, and we'll see the same thing for the second law, you can take that statement and use it to obtain any of the other statements 
of the other equivalent statements of that law of thermodynamics. Um, I'll give a flavor for how to argue it here, but I'm not going to uh, do a complete argument. So here's the, alter alternate, uh, the alternate statement, is that it is impossible to create, to build a perpetual motion machine of the first kind. So I will just abbreviate that PMM1K. So what a perpetual motion machine would be is a machine that literally runs forever. Of the first kind, also adds in, so this is both the first and second kind require a machine that can run forever without input of energy. For the, the perpetual motion machine of the first kind though, um, also does useful work. So that would be, that's purely if it's of the first kind. So a perpetual motion machine is one that runs forever and does useful work. A perpetual motion machine of the second kind is one that just plain runs forever. So without input of energy, this means that the heat, that the total heat transferred into the system over a cycle is zero. Um, now, in, if you look at a lot of patent applications or whatever, it'll look like they're transfers in and out, but you have to follow them all very carefully and show that over a cycle, they add up to zero. Or they're even negative, but then you can go and do useful work with the, with the excess. So here's, I will argue it from the more mathematical statement that delta E therm equals um, Q plus W. So since it's a perpetual motion machine, we're setting this equal to zero. Now, whatever our um, process is, so I'm just, and since we want to do useful work, I'll even go ahead and make it run um, counterclockwise so that we get useful work out of it. Um, this would be what it would look like, right? And so here is us doing our useful work. So that would be negative work over one cycle. So what we've got here is that on this side, this is going to be equal to negative something. But if we're actually running around in a cycle, it has to be the case that when you get back to the starting point, so say over one cycle, whatever it looks like, however many steps are involved, if I pick this as my reference point, say this is both the beginning and end of my cycle, the system has to look exactly like it did before or else it wouldn't end up back there. And so since the system didn't end up back where it started, or since, since the system ended up back where it started, that means that the average um, kinetic and potential energy of all the constituents of the gas, or more pretentiously we'll say working substance, um, has to be the same, both beginning and end. So that means that the change in thermal energy is zero, and so we get that zero clearly doesn't equal negative something, and so that means that we can't have our perpetual motion machine of the first kind. 
Now, much harder is to take this statement here that you can't build a perpetual motion machine of the first kind and turn it back to get to say delta E thermal equals Q plus W, but I'll just there say I assure you it can be done and a lot of really smart physicists spent a long time going back and forth showing that these different statements all at the end of the day say the same thing. Alrighty, so with that we'll go ahead and um, take a look in the next video on some more processes, the, this time taking a look at the uh, heat transfers and the work um, that we do on those processes. So we'll catch you in the next video.